Hello everyone. Last week we began the story of Strathholm, in which we talked about its importance for the Kingdom of Lordaeron, Arthas and the Perch, and the corruption of Belnazar, which led to the death of Mograine and the formation of the Scarlet Crusade. As a fun side note, we also ran a straw poll as to whether or not Arthas made the right call of Strathholm. Around 65% of you, you agree with the prince. There was no other choice but to purge the city. Honestly, more doubt than I expected there to be. So, with Balnazar manipulating their organization, the Scarlet Crusade they claimed a portion of Strathholm, meaning that our dungeon adventure it could be split up into two different sides. Different names have been used over the years for them. I'm familiar with the Scarlet side and the Undead side. Now, back in the day, you weren't exactly stuck to one over the other either. Very similar to something like Marauden, where the different wings are all connected to one another. The same can be said for Strathholm. With the right key or the right way to unlock the gates, the entire city lay open for you. You could also minimize the travel time if you just wanted to do the undead side by taking the back entrance straight into that area. But first, let's talk about the Scarlet side. Let's by Grand Crusader Dafrohan. They hold a portion of the ravaged city. Massive packs of undead, they roam the city streets, with the occasional Eye of Nostrama showing up, alerting the forces that the living are in their city. If you don't kill them quickly enough, then reinforcements will spawn. There's also the occasional spectral spirit walking about. You have to be very careful with your AoE, as these spirits, they don't mess around. A Ghostbuster kind of quest, it gave you a weapon to zap them up, or, you know, bring peace to the souls of those that took their own lives. They decided to hurl themselves into the myriad flames of the smoldering city, rather than become one of the Scourge. An optional boss you could summon here. That would be Postmaster Malone. The mailman, unfortunate enough to not escape the scourge and now haunts the city. He doesn't take kindly to those messing with his mailboxes. And that's exactly what you need to do to make him spawn. With keys from the Strathholm Courier, you can open them up. And I can't tell you how many times someone did this without letting the group know. The packs that spawn, each time you open them up, they can really, really hurt. So if you want to go for the Postmaster sets, at least let your group know. Near the Courier is also some of the finest tobacco found on Azeroth. The premium Shiabi tobacco from Fresh Shiabi. Men, as far as Kalteris, spoke of the legendary Fresh Shiabi's premium tobacco. It was a delicacy enjoyed by every single person of importance that visited Strathholm. People like King Terranus, Ufra the Lightbringer, High Lord Fordring, all of them have enjoyed Shiabi's specialty. Sadly, Fresh stayed in his shop when Strathol was invaded, swearing on his life that the Scourge would never touch his tobacco. Now he too is a Scourge and hostile to anyone that dares to touch his products. Through the market row we go, onwards to the next section. And having new people in your group, it was always an awesome experience, as they had no idea of the traps found within the city. Who knows how many adventurers were trapped by the gates closing around them, the play critters eating away at their flesh. Or the greedy kind of adventurer, they saw a supply crate as a fast ticket to their epic mount, only for it to crumble in their hands and a terrible disease chipping away at their health. Now, not all of the crates are fakes, though. Some actually contain Strathholm holy water. Curiously enough, it is mentioned in the questline to have been used by the Knights of the Silver Hand as the scourge Shrefu Strathholm. They stored it inside these small crates, along with other vital supplies, and then distributed them throughout the city. Unfortunately, the citizens, they turned into scourge reinforcements before the supplies could ever be used. You have to wonder when Arves and his forces had time to do this while they were slaughtering the civilians. All the same, a powerful rare resource against the undeads, as well as used in several different quests. Through Market Row we go, and around this area, you can find a rare spawn called Harsinger Forsten. Quite a farmed individual, as he drops an awesome toy, the Piccolo of Flaming Fire. Have you ever felt like making your entire raid team dance to your tunes? Well, now you can, with this Piccolo, take it from the body of poor Forsten. A traveling singer and Piccolo player, whose only crime was being in the doomed city during the calling. He now continues to wander the city in death, unable to accept his tragic fate. Onwards to the Unforgiven, or Lilia as she was called in life, a blade of righteousness amongst her people. After Arthas commanded his forces to purge the city, her sanity was ripped apart from seeing countless innocents die by her hand. She fell on her sword to escape the madness around her, and she now exists as a spectral being, forever denied absolution for her heinous act. That's the official journal description. What a quest, they also make mention of her committing heinous acts against innocents, but in the name of gaining unholy power rather than following Arsa's orders. All the same, we put the spirit to rest and then backtrack to the market row, where Timmy the Cruel is waiting around the corner. Timison was infamous for his savagery on the field of battle. Some speculate that his sadism stemmed from the ceaseless bullying he endured as a child. 
Now reborn as a scourge monstrosity, his mind shattered. He's tormented by those memories, causing him to ask to the name that he once loathed. At Crusader Square, we come close to the heart of the organization, as we finally encounter the Scarlets. In the original version, they used to be alive, of course, constantly fighting the undead that dare to come close. It's beautiful to see how they designed this part of the dungeon to be very similar to the Scarlet Monastery, and one of the first mini-bosses that's Malord the Zealous, risking everything to protect the Scarlet Bastion from being desecrated by the undead and us as well. Next to him is a little strong box containing the Medallion of Faith, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Down we go into the hordes, pretty much their armory. By picking up the blacksmithing plants, we can spawn their hammersmith. Worth to do so, as it prevents them from creating more demonic weaponry. But the real threat down here, that would have to be Cannon Master Willy. As nothing looks more glorious than your ranged players. Instant and unaware, they stay far away from the boss, so they're safe and they can shoot him, until they figure out that they're actually trash packs spawning at the edge of the room. Fire at will! Trash, which you can then blow up by turning the cannons against them. A nice little mechanic to play around with. You gotta balance out the balls that you have to the damage that you take. Back up we go, onward to our final encounter. Right across of it is Archivus Gelford, a man adept at fire magic, who now watches over the most valued documents of the crusade. On his wall, we find a hidden painting of love and family. A reminder of better times for Tyrion forging and his family, a time before his exile. We pick it up to bring it back to his son, and then convince him to get out of the Scarlet Crusade. The damned corrupted organization, corrupted by the dreadlord Belnazar. He is our final boss on this side of the instance. But at the time, nobody really knew what was going on. Nobody knew that Grand Crusader Dafrohan had actually died a long time ago. The Scarlets were ferocious and zealous in their actions. Yet now we realize what exactly has happened. His head is brought back to reveal the truth. Only problem though is that Dreadlords, they can't exactly be killed on ass or off. They just return to the Twisting Nether to come back later on. And with the Cataclysm revamp, we saw that Belnazar, he wasn't too happy with the Crusaders. Now they're all brought back in on death, known as the Risen, part of what they tried to eradicate. Crusade Commander Elagor Dawnbringer of the Brotherhood of the Light, he leads us on another campaign into Strathholm. With the Scarlet Sight secure, the former Bastion of the Silverhand back into the hands of his rightful owners, we have a fortified location to launch our next assault. This time, assault the undead side, where Alonso's chapel resides, the birthplace of the paladins. It's the only building that the Scourge cannot touch, and will be our forward base of operations in this half of the city. As soon as we step inside, Magistrate Barfilis, he alerts the city of their intruders at the gates, and then runs off to warn Lord Riven there. Getting to the Lord is going to be a little bit tricky, as the Scourge forces, they have upgraded ziggurats that need to be taken down, in order to open up the gates and gain access to the slaughterhouse. I always like to look at this as playing through a Warcraft 3 campaign. A campaign that can quickly go wrong if you don't pull the mobs back. There are so many of them patrolling around that chain pulling, it's a very real threat. On a more positive side, you do have options as to what path you want to take. As long as you clear out the ziggurats, it's really up to you in what order you want to do them, what kind of threats or traps you want to face. In my case, I go for the Nerubian first. Naruba Khan, a fearsome warrior during the War of the Spider. The war between the Lich King and the Nerubians. Ultimately, she succumbed to her wounds and was raised into undeath as an obedient minion of the Scourge. Now the Nerubian guards a ziggurat in Strathholm, as fierce as she defended her home in life. You can now decide to move forward past the gate and deal with the trap there, or you could backtrack a little bit, pick up the Blackguard Swordsmith while you're at it, and then take on the Baroness. While she lived, Anisteri took what she wanted, no matter the cost. Death has done little to change that. Her soul ripped from her body, Anisteri became a banshee, and she has abandoned her love of material trinkets in favor of possessions of a far more sinister kind. As we saw when she tried to convert our paladin buddy into a death knight. And during our battle, she'll try to take over the body of her comrades. Deal enough damage and she'll be forced to leave the vessel and face us herself. Giving us enough time to take her out and clear the ziggurats. The third defender, that is Maliki the Pellet. Amongst the first to join the cult of the damned. Showing tremendous aptitude in harnessing the chill of the grave. Driven by an insatiable desire for power, the mage fervently hones his skills in dark magic to prepare for when he be remade as a lich. Let's not have them add another lich to the ranks. And with the final ziggurat down, our pathway into the slaughterhouse opens up. 
Around the corner, we first have poor old Magistrate Butterfillis who's hanging out. An innocent purged by Arthas and his forces during the culling. The Lich King eventually raised the former Magistrate and commanded the hulking undead monstrosity to guard his ruined home. Let's put him out of his misery and claim the key to the city as our own. Easy access for our next adventure in here. Now at the Slaughter Square, we have the abominations that come into two variations. There's the Venom kind and the Bile Spewing kinds. After these butchers, we have Rammstein showing up, the monstrosity that took Nefanos' life. One of the Scourge's most infamous abominations, a horror stitched together from numerous corpses and empowered by a ceaseless hunger. This monster committed unspeakable atrocities on countless innocent souls when Scourge forces overran the city. We're down to the final lines of defense now. Now they don't mean much these days, but back then having an army of undead rushing towards you, it was pretty damn epic. Not to mention that the black guard sentries, they quickly followed after. A bit of crowd control, it goes a long way, until only one is left standing, Baron Rivendare. In life, he was a rich landowner, right here in Strathholm. He was also friends with Kelfuzad, and the latter convinced him to join the cult of the damned. Rivendare eventually became a death knight and was placed in control of the burning remains of Strathholm. He held the city against the Scarlet Crusade and even a number of heroes. Some even ventured in here to do a speed run, part of a massive questline to get dungeon tier 1 or 2, something like that. It was to run the entirety of Strathholm within 45 minutes. Aim of the game was to save Yasida Harmon before she was executed. Things like the Strathholm Holy Water, it definitely helped it a bunch during these runs, as the damage would clear large packs rather quickly. That medallion of faith we talked about earlier, that comes in to request the aid of Rivendare's son Arius. He lets us know about how he nearly fell from grace, how his faith wavered and the scourge nearly seduced him into becoming a death knight. Sensing his peril, he fled to this sacred place, to the chapel, where he knew he would be safe. To step outside would mean immediate doom for a paladin, but with this medallion of faith, he should have the strength to stand up to his father and remove his vile corruption from the city. And that's exactly what happens. In our final confrontation, the son shows up to help us fight his father, but the battle, it does leave him scarred and wounded. We're told to leave him here to die, to die in peace. But then, a little bit later on with the Burning Crusade, the Blood Elves were added to the game, and we see Arya show up again. The Blood Elf Paladins, also known as the Blood Knights, they were placed on a quest to show who the true Paladins were, the true Masters of the Light. It took him into Strathholm, of course, Alonso's chapel, where they extinguished the eternal flames and removed the light's protection. Those inside, they weren't too happy about their actions. Arius, as well as paladin spirits, they tried to defend their chapel from the Blood Knights, but they failed. Arius actually goes down, meaning that the Blood Elves, they got their mount, while the chapel wasn't doing too great. Two instances, two stories in which Arius seemingly dies. But as you can tell by now, dying in Strathholm, it rarely means actually dying. Whereas the original Baron Rivendare, he was moved to Naxxramas and took his spot amongst one of the four horsemen. His son was raised to the Death Knight and now rules over the city. Just another Rivendare to take out, another chance at getting either his very shiny epic sword or the Rivendare's Death Charger. One of my very first videos was actually on how to sow to this place, how to farm for this mount. Very good memories. So yeah, that's the story of Strathholm. Whereas our Brothers of the Light, they hope that one day, it will once again become a paragon of all that's good in the world. It seems like there's still a lot that needs to happen before death will ever be a possibility. The choices of the past, they've left an everlasting mark, not just on the city, but also the land surrounding it. We have had a couple of glimpses on what's going on in the city after the Cataclysm. For example, in Legion, Paladins return to the city for their High Lord Charger Mount. A love note to the Paladin Mount quest of old, in which they had to cleanse the Mount of Death Knight Dark Reaver. This time around, they go for Shadowmane, the Mount of Arius. Now we go to Rivendare's crypt to confront his specter. Not up, Paladins! We ride! They'll bring up the rear, while we're inside dealing with Rivendare. Where is his body? It should be here. Someone's taken it. This does not bode well. Well, we expected to confront Rivendare. Instead, we see Ramian the Soul Taker, who tries to stand in the way of the Paladins. He shall spread the plague over this land once more, and all will bow before him. Here we've gathered the mightiest Paladins of the world, and under our leadership, we make sure that his plans never come to fruition. Now, it does seem like the undead still have quite a hold over the city. But the Paladins, they're going to keep a closer eye on it. And it does look like the Lich King's influence is definitely diminishing. Manifil's gift, the pentagram inside the slaughterhouse, it seems to be gone now. 
the scourge equivalent of holy ground, the place where Raz Frost Whisper cut his own neck with a smile upon his face. It could also be a phasing thing, of course. But for now, the pentagram does seem to be gone. And then, in Battle for Azeroth, the city saw darkness, which some would describe as being even worse than the plague, even worse than the culling. This city was turned into a pet battle dungeon. Undead fiends with shadowy figures pitching us and our battle team in the most epic confrontations the streets has ever known. Other fires and piles of corpses litter the background. We battle our way through the dungeon. What a waste of time this has been. With that, I think we cover pretty much the major things that went down in Stratholme. Honestly, I am very surprised how much story, how many events actually took place here. Such a badass city, man. But yeah, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed this one. And until next time, guys. See ya!